Hello and welcome. Can folks hear me out there? Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I first wanted to say happy Diwali for all of you who celebrate. Um, I hope you have a chance to share some sweets with some friends and family later today. Um, thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, this is a collaboration with the STEE Fund and API Scholars. API Scholars is the organization that I'm a part of. Um, the STEE Fund is a national organization dedicated to the mental health and emotional well being of young people of color and works in partnership with leaders in higher education, the corporate sector, nonprofits, and with community partners to promote mental health and well being of young people of color. Um, API Scholars is the nation's largest nonprofit organization devoted to creating opportunities that provide access to higher education and resources that cultivate academic, personal, and professional success of Asian and Pacific Islander Americans, or APIAs. These efforts aim to advance the conversation around access to education, elevate the voice of the APIA community, and empower API leaders to drive systemic change. So this event uh, is a meeting of two amazing organizations, a collaboration between the Steve Fund and the Community Conversation Series where they've created a space to discuss timely topics and build community so we can together support and promote mental health and emotional well-being of our young people. And we have some amazing young people to hear from today. Um, and so this event, will run about an hour and we invite you to share your thoughts and experiences and just any reactions or responses in different ways throughout our hour in the chat. Um, and I'd also like you to be aware of that today's event is being recorded. And so we may share in part, in full or parts with others who cannot make this time together. With that said, um, this, this webinar is all about the students and I'm so excited uh, to introduce you to a very special person, Eve Wang is joining us from Southern California. And so, hi Eve. Um, I've known Eve for about a year now and I've seen her uplift our scholars with confidence and share her ideas on advocacy and change with such passion. So I'm very honored that she is moderating today's panel for us. And she's also applying to law school. So any of you who are in higher education, who have influence and, and power, um, a very hint for you all, any institution would be lucky to have her as a student at their campus. Um, with that said, Eve, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Tom. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Eve. Um, I'm tuning in from Southern California in our uh, at the Compton Courthouse in our community closet. So that's where there's a closet behind me. Uh, I'm super excited for today's discussion. Um, I'll be, like Tom said, I'll be your moderator today. A little bit about me. My name is Eve. I use she, they pronouns. Um, I graduated in Berkeley in 2019, and I was an NAPC scholar starting in my sophomore year. So it's been a while. I've been at APIA. I love them. I love the work that they do here. Um, and ever since I became a scholar, APIA has only continued to support me in my education and my career through COVID, um, especially because I graduated in 2020, so everyone's favorite year. Um, but I'm excited to hear from these lovely students about how they've been handling it, their take on it, um, about their mental health, and how they've been uh, processing their education through the pandemic. So let's get started with introductions. Um, starting with Caitlin, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your experiences, and adjusting back to school this semester? Hi, Eve. Yes. Um, can everyone hear me? Can everyone hear me? Okay, awesome. Yeah, okay. I just wanted, to, just wanted to confirmation because I can't see anyone else. Um, but yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Eve. Um, as she said, I'm Caitlin. I am a undergraduate student at West Virginia University. I'm majoring in biome biomedical engineering and multidisciplinary studies, which is um, recent for me. Um, so this is my first semester back in... Um, just kind of just back in person. I majority of my classes are back in person. This year I only have um, like two online classes, which is definitely a big change from the past like two and a half semesters um, prior to this one. Um, I think overall the biggest change is just seeing people and having stuff to do. Um, before you know on Zoom you went to class and you 
turned off your and then you left the zoom room and turned off your computer and you were just home but now i think a lot more is being asked of me um and a lot more and i'm participating a lot more just in my campus which i'm so so happy to do but that adjustment i'm not used to being as busy um and for sure like it's been amazing it's so great to just see everyone and um that's how my uh the first couple weeks or couple months back in person has been uh very busy but still very happy to be here Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, it's definitely been emotionally taxing and socially taxing recently, especially with students going back in the fall. And like, thank you so much for providing your time here. <laughs> uh, let's move on to Noor. Noor, are you with us? All right, let's move on to uh, Missy then. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, it is bright and early here in Hawaii, Ne. It is 9 a.m. Um, so hi, everybody. My name is Missy. Uh, my full name is Missy Matoka Unutoa. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Um, I'm currently a third year mechanical engineering student with a concentration in aerospace here at UH. And I recently just got a minor in American studies. So super stoked about that. Um, so, so far this semester, I believe UH is going back to full time on campus this upcoming spring semester. So I'm really looking forward to getting back on campus and just really getting to meet more people. Um, this past semester has just really been online and it hasn't been uh, the absolute best. Um, but I feel like going back to school next semester would definitely help me out and, you know, meeting more people, getting that one on one with the professor again. Um, this transition. Um, I'm really hoping, looking forward to meeting my friends again, everyone from out of state and in state, um, and just getting to, to know more people um, and super excited about that. Um, other than that, though, I'm super excited to be here with you folks today. Can't wait to share um, what me and Caitlin and Nora have <laughs> discussed in the past, and we can't wait to share that with you folks. So it's nice meeting you all. <laughs> hey, awesome. Thank you so much, Missy. Um, yeah, it's definitely seeing, uh, first of all, you guys are both like scientists, which is crazy to me. Uh, like I said, I want to be an attorney, so I've avoided math my entire life, so go you guys. Uh, through the first couple of weeks of you guys transitioning back to campus, has there been a specific uh, recent time where you didn't feel supported maybe on campus, uh, specifically concerning your AP, AAPI identity? We can start with Katie. Yeah, um, so... Um, being back on campus, there's coming back like from a very, I would say, like turbulent year with just uh, ongoing social issues um, with, you know, Black Lives Matter and Stop Asian Hate. I think I will say I didn't feel during that time as supported. I feel like it took my university a really long time to just even issue a solidarity statement. Um, I definitely wasn't given a space to talk about um, how I was feeling or um, just how I was processing everything in the news. It just wasn't, the response that, you know, Stop Asian Hate received wasn't as quick or as um, large as, um, Black Lives Matter, um, not that one issue is more important than the other, they're both uh, very important to me, um, but I just think after that, they were just very quick to respond, and I wonder if that could have been from like the backlash that we received when we um, did post about Black Lives Matter in the summer of 2020. Um, it was like the backlash we received from like the immediate community around us, you know, old like former professors, current professors, um, just the former students like alumni were um, kind of like bashing uh, West Virginia University saying like, we're too woke and too political and attacking our, um, you know, athletes. And it was just uh, very unfortunate that that's the res majority response we received. Um, and so I think that's kind of why it happened. But I will say there are some steps that uh, just uh, individual um, groups on the campus are taken, which I'm very happy uh, to be a part of. And um, I can elaborate more on that uh, 
later or right now, or just like touch base on that, however you want to do it, Eve. Yeah, I was gonna say it's, it's so true and it's so accurate that like it is on the responsibility of kind of the students to be the ones to say something because you can't really always rely on the administration because either from the backlash or just a lack of action. Um, what's this that you mentioned, like uh, a couple of groups that helped you with this transition and with this feeling? Uh, maybe you can talk more about like what specific groups and what your experience was like and everything. Yeah, for sure. So um, just within the engineering college, I've um, been invited to be a part of a committee that is dedicated to putting on a diversity, equity and inclusion conference um, for our um University, and I think we are trying to invite our like you know partner universities like um, uh, West Virginia Potomac, Potomac State and West Virginia State University, um, and they're like you know within three hours of us. So I think that's really awesome. And it's we the only um, our coordinator, our advisor, she's just pretty much the money aspect. She's just gonna make sure we're in budget. But you know it's a handful of stuff of students less than 10 who all represent, you know, different underrepresented groups. Um, you know, I'm representing um, Society of Women Engineers and, um, you know, Asian and um, Pacific Islanders students. Um, we have, you know, the president of the uh, NSBE National Society of Black Engineers. We have SHIP, it's the Society of Hispanic Engineers. So we're like bringing all these underrepresented groups together and we're gonna, having this opportunity to, you know, bring in people for this conference that we think would benefit. And we really wanna focus on um, allyship the most. I think it's really beneficial that, that you know, we're all here right now um, getting to talk in our own little niches that we may not um, have on our uh, immediate campus, but we also know that's really important to bring those um, majority groups in with us so they can also be an advocate. And I think that's the route we're wanting uh, to go with this conference. And it's, you know, just even that little instance of, you know, someone in our college is wanting to support um, its underrepresented students. So hopefully after this, then maybe like all of WVU can like start making uh, changes or efforts uh, within the campus and creating just the space for those groups. Cause I think, like I said before, you know, we have them they're just very small and don't get hurt as much, but for all of us to come together and like amplify each other's voices, it's such a great thing and I'm really excited for it. Yeah, I love that. It sounds like an amazing event that brings us so much inclusivity and like togetherness at a time that I think we need. Um, also, really quick before me see you start, uh, Nora, I see that you're here if you wanna do a quick little intro, uh, where you're from, where you're tuning in from, what you're studying, all that stuff. Hi everyone, just double checking, can you guys hear me? <laughs> okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Nora. Uh, I'm currently, I'm from Hunter College. I'm at a Rene for coffee shop. <laughs> I'm, just done. Uh, I'm double majoring in Chinese and psychology with a minor in Asian American studies. Um, yeah. I'm two games in New York. All right, nice. awesome. Okay, so uh, Missy, going back to you and your answer, uh, has there been a specific time when you have you felt unsupported as an AP, AAPI student on campus? Um, Yeah, for sure. I feel like um, a lot of the stuff that I have to say kind of correlates with what Caitlin had said. Um, here at UH, I feel like um, during my transfer back home because of COVID, um, I feel like I was missing out on a lot of stuff just because I was transferring. And I feel like the school didn't do enough to have those spaces, like Caitlin was saying, for us to sit down and talk about these needed issues at hand. Um, and I also did feel that because Hawaii is such like a melting pot for different types of cultures and, you know, different ethnicities, I feel like that issue wasn't really needed to be talked about, especially because of how inclusive and diverse Hawaii already is. Um, but I do feel like that's still an issue that still needs to be talked about, regardless of what goes on in the nation. Um, I just feel like there needs to be more spaces, as Caitlin had said, um, and just talk about those needed issues that are going on in the world today, that the, the kids that are majoring and that are not majoring in humanities, like me and Caitlin and engineering, we don't really get to touch upon those issues. So I feel like all students and universities nationwide, worldwide still need to be and educated and informed about what's going on, regardless of, you know, race, um, you know, politics and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, I feel like that schools do need to do a, um, a lot more better with 
communicating with their students and letting them know that, hey, we're here as, you know, an open space, as, you know, we, we have resources for you to, um, you to look into, and there's people you can talk to as well. Um, so yeah, I feel like there, um, I did not feel supported as much as I wanted to this past year, but I do feel like that because of what's been going on and the issues that have been um, brought upon that uh, schools will probably be, you know, doing more in the future and hopefully um, for universities nationwide, so. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. I think it's definitely important to lean on your peers, especially when the administration isn't maybe doing what they're supposed to. Um, and like kind of on that vein, uh, Nor, I was wondering for you, there's so much stigma surrounding mental health, um, especially in the AAPI community with friends and family. Um, and I was wondering to you, what aspect of um, the difficulties of students accessing mental health do you think is the most difficult? Oh. So from my own experience, it's probably just finding a mental health like uh, professional that like understands your values, your ethnic background, just like being able to relate to you on that level. A lot of the times when I was searching for a therapist, I had a very tough like first year as a Christian, and I came across like, a lot of bumps and stuff, and I took it very personally. <laughs> but um, I learned like it's not necessarily my first time doing all these things. Like it's okay to have like that type of patience with myself so um and I knew I needed help but I was able to learn that through therapy the hardest part was just like finding someone that like was from my background I'm Pakistani American so like somebody who understood like the cultural values I'm also Muslim so like those religious values and like how sometimes they complex and it's like very complex you know everybody has like different identities that affect them and stuff so it was finding someone who can I could relate to who I could like explain stuff and I didn't have to exhaust myself explaining stuff that somebody already knew experienced because they were part of the same community they're aware of the issues so that was one thing um the other was just like being able to go because there is so much like uh you know people don't like talking about mental health like nobody wants to say like oh my daughter's like seeing a therapist so a lot of times my mom's just like she's going to a doctor like she's you know, she just like not feeling that great, you know, that or you know, just excuses. So people couldn't tell that, oh, yeah, I was like struggling. But um, over time, like, there is a lot of different issues that came up in media, too. Like, I believe in like Texas, there was that horrible, horrible like murder suicide with this Bangladeshi boy with his brother. They were both clinically depressed and they made a pact where they would like murder their families and they themselves, and it was tragic. And I think that was like what kind of got to my mom. She's like, this is a serious issue, like this has like consequences and people, if they don't get the help that they need, like it, it's unfortunate like situation, but it happens and it's better to like pay attention, just set aside like cultural values and needs like you're fine, like this, um, you can avoid that type of situation and just like help your kid just out of love, you know? Yeah, I think you put that really beautifully, especially when you said like, how arduous it is finding a therapist. I think people, especially older people, when talking to younger people about mental health, don't understand how taxing it is to like essentially do speed dating, but you're spilling your trauma to like multiple people to just see what vibes, um, how emotionally taxing that is. Uh, what advice would you give to someone who's like currently going through that, where like they already got over the hump of like contacting therapists, but like they're going through the speed dating and it's like getting kind of a lot? Um, for personally, for me, I was fortunate enough where, like, the therapist that I reached out to, like, she reached back, like, after I didn't respond for a while, and, like, she told me her rate, I'm like, oh, okay, I can't afford that, um, she reached back, she talked to me, and then she took the initiative, I was very fortunate enough, but, um, for finding a therapist, I would just recommend, like, if you have any friends in the community that have, like, a therapist or something, sometimes some, some mushrooms are getting more, like, aware, they have their own therapist now, there are more and more, especially in New York, there are some, there's also, like, national ones that can provide like, these type of services like there is more like you know therapists involved just try to see what's already in your community try to oh i'm so sorry someone having difficulty hearing me oh i can hear you um but okay. it's just a little bit loud in the background maybe yeah I'm so sorry, I'm with a top shelf. So um, I apologize. Let me like speak a little louder. So um, just like reach out to people within your community, people who are like involved in like mental health in your community. There's a lot of people who are big activists. If not, go on social media. Like reach out to people who post stuff and be like, do you know any therapists who are like South Asian or from my background or anything like that? Like, don't be afraid to reach out. Even like if somebody reach out to me, I would definitely like tell you. There's if you're Muslim like or South Asian or this thing. Like have with those type of things, I would tell you to reach out to Corona Center. Like they're a really great group. There's a lot of them in New York. 
it's a lot of googling a lot of googling a lot of reaching out trying to see like oh what do you help people with you know like what are your experiences with with different types of like communities and students and stuff before you go into the whole trauma aspect <laughs> like i definitely understand it's very exhausting but um just see what's in your community see the activists that are active go through social media it's going to be a lot of work in a way but if you find like the perfect fit for you it's, yeah it's basically like dating you find the perfect fit for you and, and you guys carry it through it's like a really really great and beneficial relationship yeah great resources definitely like a lot of stuff to look into um missy i know you noticed that i know you noted that uh you're mostly online and so for your perspective with was like regarding student mental health um what's your experience been like yeah, so I think um, a lot of the stuff I have to say kind of aligns with what uh, Nora was saying. Um, so growing up in Hawaii in a Samoan household, uh, mental health hasn't been really spoken at home. Um, I think it's just because how my parents were raised. Uh, so because how they were raised is how they were going to raise their kids. And because mental health was never brought up back in the day, it's something that they didn't think that was supposed to be brought up now. So I feel like that has to deal with a lot of it too. Um, I can't speak for all Pacific Islanders, but for me and Samoans, I know I have a lot of friends that also have the same issue that they don't talk about mental health like at all. Um, it seems like there's this notion that Samoan parents feel like their kids are always okay, like they're always doing well, and that there's nothing wrong with my kid. And if they do bring up mental health, it seems like if they do tell their friends and family um, that there's something wrong with my kid, like because they're seeing a therapist that there's something wrong that we did something wrong when uh, when we were raising them and hence the reason why they don't bring it up at all um i think another thing too has to do with is like parental pressure um being the oldest out of four um they always feel like i'm always doing i have to do things right um and because i have that mindset i feel like if i do something you know a little bit wrong or if i do something that isn't within their standards they kind of get out of hand and they try to put me back on track even though that thing I did wrong is something that I need to learn from. And like, I need to talk to somebody about because it's, you know, I need to grow from there. Um, yeah, so parental pressure, I can, again, I can't speak for all Pacific Islanders or Asian Americans, but I just feel like that this issue about mental health does need to be talked about, um, especially with the pandemic and people transitioning out of the pandemic. I feel like that needs to be more um, work done for students in universities. Um, and I've witnessed this in my own life with, you know, again, friends, you know, growing up in Hawaii, there's a lot of different mixed races. So there's a, there, there's a lot of mixed messages coming from different people, um, from Asian Americans to like people like Noor and Caitlin. There's just a lot of issues. And I feel like mental health does need to be put on the table and parents do need to understand. So like Noor, I'm really happy that her mom was able to talk to her about that sort of stuff. And then hopefully my parents have the opportunity to talk to me about mental health. So I think it's just really about communicating with them and letting them know like, hey, this is what we talk about in the modern times. And it's like not back in the day. And this is something that you do need to talk about with your kids. Um, so yeah, I feel like this is a, a big issue. And I feel like because um, I've been exposed to this because of like Nora and Caitlin, I've been so fortunate enough to have friends who have reached out to me about mental health and reaching out to a therapist. So like Nora was saying, it's really about like that vibe you have with your therapist. Like because I'm Samoan American, I can't just go to talk to someone who's Haole in Hawaiian or in, in Hawaii. That means someone who's out of state or who is white. So that'd be very different to if I was talking to someone who is Samoan American and understands the culture values and the Fa'a Samoa. So yeah, it, it's it's really about researching, like Nora was saying, you know, reaching out to people. I know Sham is really good with the um, the outreach on the Instagram. Um, so yeah, just feel free to do your research. Um, research wisely. I think that's a, a big thing too. Um, that schools could do is just you know just push all those resources to students and just reach out to students in any way possible to make sure that their education at their um, respective universities is the, the very best so yeah you brought up so many amazing things Missy. uh the first thing that i want to bring up is you said that you were the oldest of four and like being the oldest sibling of any poc family is you deserve a badge <laughs> that's amazing and it's so amazing that your siblings have like you to look up to too that is having these conversations, I feel like we've stopped at like awareness, like everyone's aware, we need to start having the conversations now. Um, so with that, like you're saying the administration needs to push these resources, as a student, how would you best receive them? Like, would you want an email? Would you want like the student government to do it? Would you rather like cultural orgs do it? Like what would be best for you? Yeah, um, I feel like the stuff that Caitlin was saying, like how she has that organization, I feel like there needs to be a lot of more student led um, kind of like student governments in a way, 
Um, for students, I feel like emails are kind of redundant. People don't really look at it. You know, when you open up your Gmail app, it's like 30 plus emails, you know, like from assignments doing all that sort of stuff. It's kind of overwhelming when it kind of goes throughout the semester. Um, so I feel like student organizations, student-led organizations, um, of course, with staff to help them out as well is really good. Um, and just having those talks like we have our, that we have today, just, you know, sitting down, talking with other students, just having that one-on-one -on -one and seeing, you know, how they um, go throughout their day and what, what they go through with mental health, I feel like is very important. Yeah, I agree. And like on the same vein of um, kind of creating more inclusive campus, um, Caitlin, I wanted to ask you, um, in your, for kind of your perspective, like how would you like to receive mental health services or like have the, the talk be brought up, like the professors or like what? Um, I think it's really important for um, professors and just like, you know, administration to realize that it is going to be hard for some students to reach out. Um, like um, you see and Nora were saying like, um, you know, this isn't something that, you know, is often talked about or validated in our homes. Uh, Nora stopped responding to uh, her therapist and, you know, she reached, her therapist reached out and just doing that um, check-in is really important for students. You know, professors can uh, offer office hours or say, you know, if you need anything, come to me. But, you know, I'm not, I, there's like a sense of pride and a sense of, um, how to put it, like we don't think our issues are as serious as what they might be. And any, even if they are, we're not gonna be um, as eager to reach out and say like, hey, I need help because it a lot of it I think comes from pride and just not feeling validated you know, about our issues. So just having that check-in with your students, just like saying, hey, like, how are you? And it may be hard if you are in like a 200 person lecture hall, maybe your professor isn't as likely to reach out. But now that I'm in my major courses, you know, our classes are only 40 students and those 40 students stay together. And these are professors that I'm going to see up until the day I graduate. Um, so for the next uh, three semesters um, after this one, you know, they're going to know me and know my face. So if they were to reach out and say like, hey, like, how are you? Like, what can I do for you? I think that is really important just to reassure students that, you know, you do care because I think um, a lot of people feel like it's just become something that has to be said now. Um, just like, you know, people look at our pronouns and our uh, name profile right now. They're like, oh, we just have to do that now. And it's like, no, we, we're doing that because we want to and, we, and it is something um, that's inclusive. Um, and I personally, like, I personally have a mentor who, you know, assigned himself to me. Like I didn't, it was a very different mentorship. You know, he came to me and he's like, I think you would benefit from um, being my mentee. And if anyone ever wants free therapy, get a mentor who's also a psychotherapist. Um, I, I really liked how my mentor is a psychotherapist. So I get free, I sometimes get a little bit of free therapy, um, but he know he just knows me. He knows I'm not gonna be the person to be like, hey, I'm struggling. Um, he's gonna reach out and do like a check-in especially if he knows like exams are coming up um, or if like something or like a big event happened, like he's going to say like, hey, like, did you see this? How are you doing? And then he invites me along uh, to come and to talk just like Sean did with me. He invited me here to be on this panel with you all. Um, so I think it is a two way street um, for sure. So just acknowledging that for students, you know, it is a two way street and, you know, it may be uh, the it, either end may be a little bit different. Uh, so just acknowledging that. Yeah, that two-way street is, is so true, uh, which kind of leads me to my next question. Um, I know we have a lot of higher ed folks here, so I kind of want to ask you guys what has been working. Um, and if the higher ed folks, if you, any of you guys want to drop a um, question, you can do that directly in the Q&A. Uh, we have a lot of like different perspectives here, and I think it's like a really good time to check in on a student perspective uh, in a really like easy way rather than approaching a student. Um, but for you guys, what has been, I know Caitlin lucked out, that's amazing. Uh, that reminds me of like, I went to a, a yoga class the other day and it turned out to be a yoga therapy class, super fun. Uh, <laughs> and like little forms of mental health like that. But for you guys, what's been working for you? Like besides um, like either on campus resources or like community resources, uh, what's been up? Missy, you can go also. <laughs> Okay, um, so yeah, I feel like Caitlin had said a lot of good stuff. Um, I feel like uh, going off of the how the professors and staff can, you know, help students out, I feel like that they need to know that we have familial responsibilities. And I know Nora and Caitlin can vouch for me on that, that 
we have lives too and that what Eve was saying that being the oldest, we do deserve a badge. I really do think that all oldest kids do need a badge and everyone below them, you know, second, second oldest to the youngest that we have lives and we have stuff to attend to with, uh, with our parents. Um, you know, going, uh, growing up in Hawaii, um, I'm looking to commute next semester and the drive is about maybe 26 miles to the university. So with that in addition as well, I do need to take that into account and that students also have commuting lives as well that, you know, gas isn't super cheap. We all know that the gas is almost five bucks a gallon. And in Hawaii, it's reaching that five, uh, five um, dollar mark. Um, so yeah, going off of the familiar responsibilities, I feel like professors can help students by reassuring them from the first point of contact, you know, re uh, reaching out with that syllabus that say, hey, we're here for you. Like we can talk about what you're going through. We can have those sit downs. Um, you know, having that reassuring talk during that first week of the semester is very important. And I feel like a lot of students don't really pay attention because it's just syllabus week, right? We go over syllabuses, we go over the quizzes, you know, all that sort of stuff. And it, there's really isn't that connection with the professor. It's just, hey, here's here's the, uh, the syllabus and that's all we have for the semester. There really isn't that connection with them. So I feel like there needs to be those sit downs like we have today and, you know, say, hey, you know, what's going on? Like Caitlin was saying, reach out to a psychotherapist. I feel like that's very important as well. Um, and yeah, that we also do have familial responsibilities. I know a lot of professors can overlook that and say, hey, you, you need to figure out something. But, you know, it's, it's hard, you know, growing up in a POC family in the modern age, that it's, it's, very, it's very difficult to, to balance responsibility and school with, you know, with the growing need of, you know, getting, you know, the bachelor's and the master's and all that sort of, it's very stressful in the end. And I feel like professors, they need to reach out to their students and say, you know what, we can have a sit down, we can have a talk and just talk about those things that need, that need to be talked about. So yeah, hopefully Nora can, can elaborate more on that from a New York perspective, so. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, I was gonna ask you also like culture, I'm from California, I was just in New York. I was a very California person in New York from your perspective, like how is it different? Um, I've been very fortunate to go to like Times Square College, and they have a PA and PC grant, and we have a like superb. I love the Asian American like department. They're all very great professors, and like they're all very like engaging. They want you to like talk to them, and you know, be at them outside about your personal interests and stuff. That's like I've been very fortunate to have that with my professors. Um, I see the situations that like Nisi and him are talking about with like having the professors reach out because I've had like professors teaching certain classes that are like focused on like POC and they're not POC and they don't understand like the struggles of being a POC. And then I definitely understand being Nisi like being like the oldest. I'm also the eldest of four siblings. So it's like such a pain, but an experience. So um, and I definitely agree that professors do need to understand like our personal background and struggles. Like they go hand in hand with our academic communication, right? It's like to anything that happens like personally at home, whatever, like it affects how you think about work. It affects how engaged you are, how like how much work you want to put in, like your motivation and all that. And it's a very like important aspect of education, especially in Hunter, like there is a lot of AEPI folks. So that's why there's like a like, growing emphasis with more students getting involved with different programs such as mentoring and like research incentive for students, which is really great, allowing like students to like connect with different professors. I've been fortunate to be part of many of them. And I feel that this should be common in all like colleges. I had this experience working in Hunter College. I've heard that other community colleges, some of them are not as fortunate. And I think that definitely I agree with that you see Caitlin, like there needs to be more student involvement because we know what the issues are. We know like our own struggles and stuff and we need to be able to engage with professors and professors should be able to like have that conversation be able to sit down with us and like talk and be like we should be able to like advocate for ourselves and you know the resources that we need in terms of support and everything because it does affect like the people that we are becoming and like you know our careers yeah and I definitely see a line of like students having to advocate for themselves as opposed to the professor like being the one to be open enough for students to want to advocate for themselves um and we have a question coming in from lisa uh what would be something specific professors could do to support you on campus and i kind of want to reframe that more i was like imagine your dream professor for whatever like studies uh or area of study you guys are in your dream professor your favorite one um would you rather like take these two scenarios it's the first day of class and like nisi said like it's syllabus week um, and they're announcing themselves to you and what they're comfortable with or like an office hour first meeting 
Um, what are you guys comfortable with? What is like the ideal situation that the professor can do to make you feel comfortable? And like, you can speak on like a long commute or like a tough day or like a family situation or something. Like, what would you guys want? Oh, and Caitlin, you can start. <laughs> Uh, that's a really good question, Eve. Um, I do respect the work-life blend. Um, so I'm not saying uh, professors have to give out their phone number or anything, but I do have professors that are, have started giving out their phone number to their students. Um, and I recently went to the Society of Women Engineers Conference and I had uh, some professors talk uh, about what they do in their classrooms and they make it a point to share um, a person of color's contribution to what we are learning about, or if it's, you know, a holiday like uh, this week is, um, you know, they'll make a mention of that. And, you know, they they were uh, white professors, but they were obviously allies and just trying to make the intention to incorporate that as part of their lesson plan. Yes, I'm in, like, we are engineering, me and Misi are um, engineering. So, you know, we may not get that, but if there is space to include it, make a space to do that and I'm also you know a part of like a LinkedIn group posted by another engineering professor who created this group of young women in STEM and engineering and he shares stories about different comp contributions that women have made uh, in different areas of engineering and science and you know we get to talk about that and I think you know it's really cool to do that like have that just space maybe outside of class to discuss certain things and then to even include that in your classroom would make an impact and I think would make um, you know students more um, open to reaching out because they know that you understand you know or appreciate like can understand and can appreciate like what their background is because you know it is unfortunate to judge based on you know looks but that's kind of like what we have to go on and I may look I don't have any professors that really look like me so I'm like oh they don't understand you know why I'm affected by certain things or you know why I have a hard time you know separating myself from my family because you know students some students don't have that issue you know they'd be like oh my mom wants me to do this I'm not going to do that but I'm like my mom needs me to go do this I have to go do it you know because I am not an accessory to the household I am part of the household like supporting it like I I take I have to pick up groceries I have to cook dinner as well and I'm not doing that just for myself I'm doing that for me and my mom and you know I have pets and I am in charge of that and just understanding that that, you know family is so centered to our culture and I feel like that's across like all um Asian Pacific Islander cultures like we like family is super important you cannot just because we're in college and we're like you know supposed to be adults and being independent does not mean that we are separated from our family um I've had like you know 50 50 on my professors being understanding about that and then just like on a side like fun note um we are having uh, the biomedical and chemical engineering department are having a bar crawl next week. And one of our professors is coming. You know, we had to sign permission forms and everything, but and it's open to anyone who's 21. And I don't, I don't know, like, it's kind of going to be fun to see my professor out at a bar and he's, he's going to be there. We're all going to be there. And it's just like, you know, just find like an opportunity to take the time to like see your students outside of class without that pressure to like, you know, just hang out. I'm not saying you don't have to go drink with your students, but that's just like one thing my professor is doing. You know, we organize a bar crawl and he's coming to that. Um, but it's going to be fun. So it's just like little things that can be done in and outside of the classroom that make a huge difference. And, you know, we, it co goes in the other way. Like I've had, you know, teachers bring their student, I mean, not their student, their children and like talk about their children. Like, I want to hear about that too. Like it, you know, humanizes you for me. And I will, you know, always understand like if we have to take a meeting on a phone call or something, cause you have to go pick up your kid, you know, if you keep that um, open for us, like we'll be open for you as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think you spoke so well to like the social pressure. Like it's so cool that your professor is like going out to drink with you guys. Um, I think it's hard for a lot of students to like see a professor as anything other than a professor. Um, the way that it was described to me and what helped me with my, my social anxiety with professors was like the thing that you love. I studied English. I'm like, this person took that and like ran with it. And they are like, they love this thing that you're studying. So like, they're probably really cool. I like in some aspect. Um, what is it, Missy? I wanted to ask you like with 
kind of taking off the professor hat and having this like casual human to human conversation with your situation and everything. Um, how would you ideally like want the professor to receive you explaining like your situation and maybe why some deadlines need to be later or maybe why like some things need to be like a little bit pushed back? Uh, what do you think? Yeah, um, I feel like Caitlin had said a lot of the things I was going to say, um, but I can just elaborate more on that. Um, I, so fortunately, this semester or for the past year, I think I've been a part of a mentorship program called the Native Hawaiian uh, Science and Engineering Mentorship Program for students who are AAPIs. Um, and it's basically just a coalition of students who are AAPIs and are not just in engineering majors, but uh, majors um, across UH Manoa. So I feel like um, they do... Um, cater to students because they have daily check-ins or monthly check-ins, excuse me. And they basically, they send out like uh, Google Forms um, and they ask students like how you're doing, like how your classes are. I feel like professors can do that, um, but I know that they're also busy as well, you know, with their own research and stuff like that. So I told, we, we get it as students and hopefully professors get where we're coming from. Um, but, you know, those daily check-ins and Caitlin said, make it personable, you know, from the very first start of the semester when we're having syllabus week, talk about your story, talk about how undergrad went, talk about your struggles of getting into grad school, of, of going through your parents and, you know, beating those, you know, societal norms. You just talk about yourself, you know, where you worked, your family, like Caitlin said, your kids. Um, you don't have to go out super in-depth. I know that there's that professional standpoint, like Eve was saying, that you have with your professors, and we totally get it. But, as, you know, make it personable, and, you know, it'll go a long way for the students. You know, as the semester goes on, you know, back in elementary school, I know Caitlin and Nora can, can vouch for me. We would have excursions, right? We'd have field trips to the to the museum. We'd have field trips to the to the beach or whatever. And you know, our teachers would talk about you know the science of it. And I feel like that can also be applied in in a collegiate standpoint as well. That you know, it, it, from an engineering standpoint, you can visit you know your um, maybe an engineering firm or maybe a student, uh, a professor's um, former student and alumni of the college. You know, all those little things that professors can do would definitely help the students in the long run and you know making it personable for the students especially during these COVID times and who knows when COVID's going to end right I feel like can definitely help them out with their education and make it you know make it worthwhile make it super fun you know at the same time while keeping it serious I feel like that uh, those things professors can do as well and like Caitlin had said before you know have those coalitions make those governments with students um, you know those inclusive environments um, and just talk story with them, have those uh, weekly check-ins with your professors. Um, and professors can also just talk story about themselves, have those sit downs, those talk story sessions. So, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And like, again, like you were saying, like there are people too. And like, of course, I'm trying to think from their perspective, like authority wise on the first day, you wouldn't want to be too lax. I understand that. But I mean, not to be like the cool teacher coalition, but like, <laughs> I think we all would appreciate so much like a really chill teacher on the first day to just be personable and talk to us human to human. And then you can put on the teacher hat later and we'll probably listen to you better later, honestly. Um, Nora, what, was, what, uh, what do you got about like perspectives about what you would want from a teacher, ideal teacher interactions, all that stuff? Um, I definitely feel like it makes you like, being more personable and stuff. It's very important for a professor to be like, personable. And also Kitten's a point about like, bring you within to the classroom, like maybe have a day where you talk about different issues. Um, I've had professors, like the ones that I felt like I could approach were the ones that like kind of straight away from like, you know, they might be taking like a psych class, but they straight away to talk about like POC issues and stuff. And they'd be like, I, I'm not talking about this because it's part of so I'm talking about it because it's important. I had a professor who did that. And like because of that, I was like, wow, like, I want to like, talk to him and go on my way. And so it's just like that was like, we're making a point that way. You know, to make you feel like valid that your experience is important, even if it's not part of what he's teaching. And that's been very like vital to me, like professors just making themselves very approachable or like somebody like that so that they care about like different communities that are, you know, what from the experience. And um, definitely I've also heard like professors who have like, um, who are very, carrying towards their students and they have like drop bys like they just have like office hours but they don't really call office hours so they're just like come by like have a chat and stuff um there's a professor that i didn't know from here i was like interviewing for a project for another professor and he was like in hawaii and uh, he he like the way um i was supposed to ask him about like lgbtq and yeah, students like how he was helping them how like it was different during covid 
and he mentioned like how he was very like what he did was like he because of COVID he kind of didn't like um the Zoom interactions but after a while he, he loved it because like a lot more students were able to come by he didn't call his office hours like office was like coffee time or like tea time or something and the kids like they would come by and they talk and have like very good conversations and I think like the other thing is like professors also feel like Zoom is always a function you know like to make themselves accessible and like, that's also very important because a yeah. lot of like ATSs that I know yeah. is being the oldest and stuff like you're not just going to school like you usually have other yeah. responsibilities you have a job you have other things so sometimes you don't have like time to talk to a professor at like normal time maybe the professor can have like oh like if those times don't work for you like maybe you could do that like, right. so like having like a general like session with the class just to be like I'm very open I'm accessible if you guys need me you know set boundaries and such and then also give them like um like students flexibility to like reach out to them and approach them and stuff especially since like I used to be a lot more introverted this year so like I needed a little shove you know to like, be able to talk to professors yeah thank you so much your answers are super insightful um I th- okay like Sham said there's a lot of higher ed people here so I'm sure they love hearing your guys is like hearing into your little brain um that being said to round us off uh this question is kind of for everyone whoever wants to jump in uh of course you know this past year like Caitlin said with Black Lives Matter and with Stop Asian Hate um in that kind of lens with that context as AAPI students how do y'all feel returning to campus do you feel supported do you feel like you know if there was a space you wanted to talk about this where to go or like how do y'all feel about that I feel like I definitely have um, people to talk about those uh, issues with and like being able to share that with my peers. You know, I may not be on student government, but you know, I'm friends with people who are. So being able to just like say like, hey, I feel like this is an issue on our campus. And, um, you know, they take that and, you know, present it to administration. And like, you know, as long as the administration like listens to our student government and they host, uh, meetings like every week to come and to you know share their voices with because they are that link to our administration so I will say like I do feel um, supported being here uh, at campus at West Virginia University Um, may be a shock because you know it is West Virginia University but if anyone knows anything about West Virginia or any stereotypes about West Virginia I'm definitely like not part of a majority here Um, but um, I think just like overall that sense of community, I have that and I'm grateful to be back and part of it. Yeah, I know for um, me, especially when I went back to Berkeley or when I went, came home from Berkeley and like Stop Asian Hate was just starting up, it was definitely hard to um, ha- just have a space to talk about it. And like, thank you guys so much for like offering your time and giving us your perspective um, about your time there. and. With that, um, I think I'll sign off and everyone watching can leave your little notes for lovely messages for our panelists in the chat. Um, But I think with that, thank you guys so much. uh, And I think I will hand it off to Sham. Thanks, Eve. And wow, I mean, now you all get to see a little bit about what my day-to-day is like. Um, I get to have conversations like these with amazing API scholars. So please uh, join me in thanking our amazing panelists, our amazing API scholars for sharing their personal pers- perspectives and insights on the college experience. Would love to hear what resonated, uh, what ideas you're taking away uh, in your own practice. Um, this is a community where we can share great ideas um, and it was so, so amazing to hear from all of you. Thank you, um, Eve, Caitlin, Noor, and Misi. Um, we also wanted to, so in terms of wrapping up, I wanted to share a little bit more about the work that the STE Fund and API Scholars uh, are a part of. Um, in, in partnership with the National Center for Inter- Institutional Diversity at the University of Michigan, the STE Fund has been working to create a guide for higher education administrators, faculty, and staff to better support APIA college students. And so I was part of this amazing group and we brought um, all, a lot of our ideas, um, mainly rooted in our students' perspectives um, and can speak to the inten- in- intentionality and the tangible action steps that are coming in this guide. And many of them are linked to the themes that um, our students brought in today. So these recommendations consider the tremendous diversity within the API college student community, as well as the tendency for API students to be overlooked due to the model minority and perpetual foreigner myths. So we discuss increasing uh, ways to increase institutional awareness 
of API stressors and mental health across campus. Um, and so we're thrilled to be launching these recommendations. So stay tuned, stay connected with this defund for that. Um, here at API Scholars, um, if you know an amazing student that would like to be on a panel like this in a couple of years, um, are, we're currently accepting applications for our API scholarship, both for our general and our Anapizi scholarship. Um, our Anapizis, which Eve and Noor were part of, um, is just one way we support our community of Asian American, Native American, and Pacific Islander serving institutions. And a API Scholars, we work hard with our Anapizi partners to create the institutional change that we want to see in higher education. All right. Um, so with that, if you'd like to learn more about our work um, that we do here at API Scholars or the Steve Fund, feel free to reach out to us via our websites or our social media channels. Um, please stay in touch with me, with, it, with the panelists, um, with our organizations and the good work. Uh, thank you again on behalf of the Steve Fund and API Scholars for joining us and we'll see you soon.